now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Faber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Willard Waterman in an episode of The Great Gildersleeve going back to June 2nd, 1954. And you may remember that Anne Hattie had came to town to try to get Leroy under control. Aunt Hattie's still around. And Gildy wants her gone. The Kraft Foods Company presents Willard Waterman as The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> family always has to make minor adjustments when relatives come to visit, but when a relative like Aunt Hattie arrives, it calls for major adjustments. After a week of such stern domination, the great Gildersleeve and Leroy find it difficult to keep smiling. Now, Leroy, it isn't as if she'll be here forever. How do you know? She'll go back home sooner or later. Let's be cheerful. I'll wait till she leaves. Then I'll be cheerful. Hey. No, my boy. She keeps the shades pulled down all day. I feel like I'm living in a coat closet. <laughs> well, I'm going to do something about this dark house. The idea. The shades pulled at high noon. Bertie! Uh, uh, Bertie! Yeah, watch it, Unc. She hates noise. Yeah. You call me next, Gillespie? Oh, <laughs> quiet, Bertie. Yes, sir. You call me. Bertie, it's a little dark in here. I wonder if we shouldn't raise the shade. Well, that would be a good idea. Hey, well, will you take care of it? Leroy, would you like to do it? Not me. Bertie, let's not pass the buck. Let's raise the shades. <laughs> this is my house, you know. Yes, sir, but you ain't giving the orders. Oh, yeah, I'll raise the shade. I'm not afraid of Aunt Hattie. Aren't you going to do it, Unc? Well... As Aunt Hattie says, no use fading the rugs. No nerve, huh? It isn't that. I'll just raise it a few inches. Oop. <laughs> Slipped out of my hand. I think I'll go out and play. I think I'll hit for the kitchen. No, wait a minute. Both of you are exaggerating. You make it sound like Aunt Hattie's a terrible ogre. But, Unc. Stop, Morton. Yeah, hello, Aunt Hattie. You have a good rest? Well, I did until people started shouting down here. Oh, sorry, Aunt Hattie. And for heaven's sakes, what's the shade doing up at the ceiling? Was that the awful racket? Yeah. Leroy, I explained to everybody that the hot sun fades rugs. I didn't do it. Bertie? Don't look at me. I'm innocent. Then uh, who could have done it? A big 220-pound elf? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Aunt Hattie, I was adjusting the shade and it got away from me. Yeah, I'll pull it down again. That's more like it. Yeah. I'll put the shades up tonight. Tonight? Then everybody can see in. Well, I have no objection to anybody seeing what I do at night. <laughs> There's nothing more heartwarming to the passing stranger than the happy family circle framed in a picture window. Who's happy? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, Bertie, when you went to the grocery this morning, did you remember to get my yeast and yogurt? Yes, ma'am. You forgot it the other day. That'll never happen again. <laughs> uh, Leroy, some children are playing in the back lot. Uh, will you tell them to be quiet until 1.15? I'm napping. Right away, Aunt Hattie. And uh, Throckmorton, you keep your little pinkies off those window shades, or Aunt Hattie will spank. <laughs> You're all right, Aunt Hattie. Now, you'd better finish your nap or you'll be cross tonight. Well, I, I had to come down and straighten you people out. <laughs> be cheerful, Unc. Like you say, she won't stay forever. I will see to that. <laughs> Leroy. Yeah, Unc? 
Step into the kitchen, will you? Okay. Bertie, close the door. Yes, sir. What's going on? While Aunt Hattie's still asleep, we're going to have a little council of war. Okay, I'll raid the ice pot. Leroy, pay attention. No eating. Well, you said it was a council of war. And they say an army marches on its stomach. <laughs> yes, yes. Now, I know we're all fond of Aunt Hattie. Yeah? Oh, yes, sir. But we're also agreed that she has overstayed her visit. Yeah. Yes, sir. Now, naturally, we want to be diplomatic about it. But we must let Aunt Hattie know she can't stay all summer. So we have to think of a plan. I can think better when I'm eating. Leroy. Bertie's thought of her plan. Oh, yes, Bertie? Bertie decided if Aunt Hattie stays around, Bertie's going on an extended vacation. What? And leave us here to eat Aunt Hattie's eggplant boiled in seaweed? <laughs> Leroy, that's eggplant cooked with spinach. A very special recipe. Yeah. <laughs> But I think Bertie has an idea. Bertie thinks so, too. What I'm getting at is, we can tell Aunt Hattie we're all going on a vacation. Yeah? Bertie can go her way. You and I, Leroy, will go up to Clear Lake and fish. And Aunt Hattie can go home. Well, I know she wouldn't want to interfere with our vacations. Hey, Uncle, you're using your head. <laughs> yes, sir. Mr. Gilsleeve's got a brain. You well. You know what you got, Mr. Gilsleeve? You got a brain. Yeah, thank you, Bertie. Can we leave right after school's out? Yeah, why not? Mayor Twilliger says I can take my vacation anytime I want. I've got everything under control at the water department. Oh, boy. That'll suit Bertie. Bertie's ready to head for the mountains and relax on the pine needles. Yeah, good, Bertie. <laughs> yes, good. sir. Instead of getting needled by Aunt Hattie, Bertie's going to relax on the pine needles. Yeah, all right, Bertie. Mr. Gilsey, you know what Bertie's going to do? Yes, Bertie. That's right. Bertie's going to relax on the pine needles. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. I wish Bertie would be more quiet. Well, come on, Uncle. Let's go break the news to Aunt Hattie. Yeah, good idea. Rock Martin. Zeke, Aunt Hattie. Uh, thought you were resting? I was, but who can rest with all the racket? You, well, Bertie was just amused about something. About what? Well. Uh, she's going on a vacation. Yes. Splendid. It's a good idea for her to go while I'm here. We have our little conflicts in the kitchen, so I'd love a free hand. Well, there won't be any cooking to do, Aunt Hattie. Why not? Well, as a matter of fact, Leroy and I will be going on our vacation at the same time. Yeah, Clear Lake. We're going to rent a cabin, huh? Yes, indeed. Well, in that case, I'll go along with you and do the cooking. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> well, it wouldn't be a vacation if you didn't have somebody to cook for you. Oh, grown. No, Aunt Hattie. We like to rough it. Yeah, the rougher the better. We'll be fishing all day, eating out of cans. Rock Martin, Leroy is a growing boy. He needs a balanced meal. Well, true. I'll but... not have little Leroy eating out of cans, like a goat. <laughs> but I want to eat like a goat. <laughs> I will go and do the cooking. Yeah, well, of course, these plans are just tentative, Aunt Hattie. I have a lot of work to do at the office. I may not be able to get away until later, probably after you've gone home. Yeah. Well, I will never leave when I'm needed. And I uh, may not get away in, until August. Mm -hmm. That's all right. I'll stay. <laughs> yeah, I think I'll stop in PV's, pick up some cigars, and go on to the office tonight. I'd rather work nights than have Aunt Hattie breathing down my neck at home. Hello, PB. Yeah, hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. What can I do for you this evening? Here, yeah, give me a handful of cigars. Yeah? I thought your Aunt Hattie made you give up cigars. Only around the house. I can smoke tonight. I'll be at the office. Oh, have work tonight? Well, yeah, let's say I prefer to. Yeah, I know what you mean. Seems I always have a lot of work to do at the pharmacy when Mrs. Peavy's mother comes to visit. Yeah, you just want to stay away from the house. <laughs> I'm very fond of Mrs. Peavy's mother. That's because she seldom comes to stay. She would if I didn't send Mrs. Peavy over there. <laughs> I like to save Mother Hawkins the trip. Oh, sure. But as a matter of fact, Mrs. Peavy's visiting her now. Yeah, care to go bowling? I don't have to go to the office. I'd like to, but I have to go home at 9 o'clock and feed the parrot. 
<laughs> Does he have to be fed at nine o'clock? If I don't, he'll tell on me. <laughs> you blabbermouth. <laughs> hey, there's your boss peeping in the door. What? Good evening, Peavy. Well, hello, Mr. Willigan. Gildersleeve. Hello, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Spending the evening at the soda fountain? You well. I thought this is where you spend most of the day. <laughs> yeah, no, Mr. Mayor. I'll take a package of these razor blades, Peavy. Okay, well. I thought all of us employees gave you an electric razor last Christmas. I still need these. I may be shaving some employee's salary if he doesn't spend more time at the office. Zoink. Hey, Mr. Gildersleeve's on his way to the office tonight, uh, aren't you, Mr. Gildersleeve? Oh, yes, yes, indeed. P.V., did Gildersleeve pay you to make that statement? No, but if he wants to, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just telling P.V., I plan to spend the whole evening at the office. Commissioner, whom are you trying to impress? Uh, nobody. I expect to be at the office nearly every night. His Aunt Hattie's living with him now. <laughs> Who? Uh, frankly, Mr. Mayor, I have relative troubles I'd rather not talk about. Uh, <clears throat> I understand. Well, I must get home before I have relative troubles. Oh, do you have relatives at home? Mrs. Terwilliger. <laughs> it's very funny, Mr. Mayor. It is not. <laughs> Goodbye, Mayor. Goodbye. I can never tell when the mayor's kidding. <laughs> he wasn't kidding about shaving somebody's salary. Yeah. No harm in letting him know I'm going to work tonight. No, I know. It's a cinch I'm not going home and sit with Aunt Hattie. <laughs> <laughs> it's no laughing matter. You don't know what we put up with. Shades drawn. In fact, they have to tiptoe around the house. She doesn't like company. Well, my aunt is so chill, is she? Say, Phoebe, we've been friends a long time. Would you like to help me get rid of Aunt Hattie? No, no Mr. Gildersleeve. Well, yeah, all right, all right. You don't want to accommodate a good customer. I'll take my business elsewhere. Well, what did you have in mind? Well, it just occurred to me that with Mrs. Beebe out of town, you could come over and stay at my house for a few days. Mr. Gildersleeve, you're not that good a customer. <laughs> no, wait a minute, wait a minute. Just think this thing through. With Mrs. Beebe away, where do you get your meals? Here at the pharmacy. Yeah, you can't live on vitamin pills. Well, I can on bologna sandwiches and banana splits. <laughs> oh, my goodness. How would you like to have Bertie prepare you a big breakfast every morning? Bacon, eggs, hot biscuits. Mm, yeah. yeah. And a big dinner every night. Thick chops, juicy roasts, two-inch steaks. What do you say, Petey? <laughs> to heck with the bologna. I'll be over in the morning. <laughs> yeah, now you're talking. <laughs> Is it all right if I bring the parrot? No, I don't think you'd better. Aunt Hattie doesn't like parrots, and you wouldn't want anything to happen to the bird. No, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> the Great Gildersleeve will be back in just a minute. June 2nd, 1954, The Great Gildersleeve on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. You ever make a change and then think, why didn't I do this years ago? Well, that's how people feel about switching to MediShare for their health care, especially now with inflation the way it is. People are very happy with the savings. Most families save about $500 a month when they switch. It's a huge help when prices are going up so fast in so many other areas. And MediShare's customer satisfaction rate is double that of health insurance. It's just a different experience, and people really like that. MediShare is an alternative to health insurance. It's a community of Christians who share each other's health care bills, and it's been going strong for over 25 years. It really is the gold standard, the most trusted name in health care sharing. Find out why people love it. Find out why they rave about the customer service and find out how good it feels to save some money right now. They're super easy to talk to. Here's the number, 833-34-BIBLE. That's 833-34-BIBLE, 833-34-BIBLE. The question I get asked periodically is, why did the laugh disappear when Willard Waterman took over the role of the great Gildersleeve? Well, Waterman said, told the people that produced the show that that was Harold Perry's laugh. That belonged to him, and that he would imitate the uh, Perry character, but he would not do the laugh. 
that was Willard Waterman's, uh, that was not Willard Waterman's to do. And so Harold Perry used it when he went over to CBS for his one year show there. And then it just sort of disappeared into the ether. All righty, from uh, June 2nd, 1954, Willard Waterman is the great Gildersleeve. <laughs> Let's get back to the great Gildersleeve. His dear old Aunt Hattie came to stay a few days, but now it appears that, like the plumbing, she'll become a permanent fixture. Mm. Getting desperate, the water commissioner has decided to capitalize on Aunt Hattie's dislike of noise and strangers. I've invited Phoebe to stay with us a few days, Bertie. Yes, sir? We'll put him in the den. Yes. He's bringing his parrot, too, Bertie. Come again? I say he's bringing his parrot. That's what I thought you said. Where does the parrot sleep? Yeah, we'll put the parrot in the hall next to Aunt Hattie's room. I was hoping you wouldn't put that bird in my room. Oh, no. Oh, this birdie would fly the coop. (laughs) (laughs) Birdie ain't got on no conversations with no parrot. Well, he can talk to Aunt Hattie. Yes. Miss Gilsey, you think Miss Hattie's going to like all this company? <laughs> oh, you got another idea. You bet. You know how Aunt Hattie hates people and noise. Oop. What's that? That's Piggy's jalopy. Oh? He and Leroy just drove it in the backyard. Gee. It's a wonder Aunt Hattie doesn't say something about this. She would, but she went to market for some eggplant and spinach. Oh, do we have to have that again, Bertie? I promised Peavy steak. Well, I ain't planning all the meals now, you know. Yeah, I know. Hi, Aunt. Hello, Leroy. Piggy. Hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. Hi, Bertie. Hello, Piggy. Aunt Piggy drove his jalopy over. I heard it. We're putting on a new horn. What do you think of it? Yeah, look. I got it hooked up to a dry cell. Yeah, put it here on the dining room table, Piggy. Okay. Yeah, do, do you have to bring it in the house? We want to work on it. Make it louder. Yeah, you can hardly hear it now. See? Oh, my goodness. Sounds like the Chicago Stockyards. <laughs> How about that, huh? How about that? <laughs> yeah, that's really great. Ooh, what It'll a loud great. boy. <laughs> yes, sir. It's a good thing Miss Hattie ain't here. Yeah, say. Biggie, how'd you like to stay for dinner? Oh, what are you going to have? Probably eggplant and spinach. I got to go home. <laughs> no, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're going back to steak tonight. I'll stay. Oh, boy. Piggy, why don't you come over and spend a few days with Leroy? <laughs> I stayed with him one night, and you nearly blew your top. You, well, uh, you shouldn't have been roller skating in your room. <laughs> but this time, it's different. Okay, but, but I'll have to go home for my trombone lesson. What the heck? Bring your trombone. <laughs> I got the den all fixed up, Mr. Gillsleeve. Yeah, fine, Bertie. Phoebe should be here any minute. Have you told Miss Hattie he's coming? No, I want it to be a surprise. <laughs> Once Phoebe's here, she can't do anything about it. No, sir. Right, Morton? Yes, Aunt Hattie? You had a phone call when you were out. Oh? From your boss. Matt Williger? He wondered why you weren't in your office this afternoon. Well, uh, where were you? I worked two nights in a row. Well, uh, uh, well, the mayor was quite bossy. As a matter of fact, I don't like his attitude. Yeah, I know. And if he calls again, I may just have to tell him in no uncertain terms. No, Aunt Hattie, let's not get me in trouble with the mayor. Uh, somebody's at the door, Frank Martin. Yeah, I know, I know. Well, Peavy. You know, Mr. Gillespie, bring your bag right in. Mm, thank you. Um, who are you, the brush salesman? No, I'm Mr. Peavy. Yeah. Aunt Hattie, this is an old friend of mine. Oh? Uh, didn't I tell you he was staying with us a few days? You most certainly did not. Yeah, well, his wife's out of town, so he asked if he might stay over here. Mr. Gildersleeve, it wasn't exactly my... <laughs> uh, Dr. Martin, uh, didn't you explain to Mr. Peavy that you already have a house guest? No, I guess. Uh, you can come into the den, Peavy, and make yourself at home. Well, I, I left the parrot on the porch. Parrot? Oh, good heavens. 
Well, Mr. Peavy couldn't leave it at home, Aunt Hattie. Well, I, I hope it doesn't talk. <laughs> oh! Oh, God. What was that? That's a parrot. Very talented. Uh, Bertie! Yes, sir? Will you get the parrot off the porch? Yes, sir. He's whistling down. <laughs> Do you people have to shout? Oh, sorry, Aunt Hattie. Uh, should I show you to your room, Phoebe? Mm -hmm. uh, now, now, don't go running off, Dr. Martin. What do you mean, Aunt Hattie? Uh, well, I, I think I should know a little more about somebody I have to stay in the same house with. Well, Mr. Peavy is our neighborhood druggist and a member of the Jolly Boys Club. You've heard me speak of the Jolly Boys. Uh, is that the noisy group that sings? Uh, I can prove I'm a member. There is a tavern in the town. Uh, I'll take your word for it. Very well. well. No, just Phoebe singing. Oh, this is getting to be the noisiest house. Oh. Oh. oh, what's that? Piggy and Leroy must be back. Oh, oh good heavens. Who's Piggy? Your little friend visiting Leroy. Another visitor? Hi, I'm Mr. Peavy. Leroy. Hello, my boy. Hi, Mr. Peavy. No, Piggy. Uh, honey, I want you to meet Piggy. Piggy who? Piggy Banks. Hi, Aunt Hattie. How do you do? Hey, Mr. Peavy, you moved in, too? Me and the parrot. <laughs> More the merrier. And that little laugh right there was as close as you got to the original Gildersleeve laugh, the great Gildersleeve, June 2nd, 1954, on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Radio. Why should I advertise on radio? There's nothing to look at, no pictures. Listen, you can do things on radio you couldn't possibly do on TV. That'll be the day. All right, watch this. <clears throat> Okay, people, and now when I give you the cue, I want the 700-foot mountain of whipped cream to roll into Lake Michigan, which has been drained and filled with hot chocolate. Then the Royal Canadian Air Force will fly overhead towing a 10-ton maraschino cherry, which will be dropped into the whipped cream to the cheering of 25,000 extras. All right, cue the mountain. Cue the Air Force. Cue the maraschino cherry. Okay, 25,000 cheering extras. Now, you want to try that on television? Well... You see, radio is a very special medium because it stretches the imagination. Doesn't television stretch the imagination? Up to 27 inches, yes. She was born in a humble shack amidst the lemon groves of Goleta, California. Mommy, don't cry. You know what they say? When life gives you lemons, make lemonade. I was going to say life sucks, and then you die. But I like yours better. And with that, Alexandra Johnson launched her lemonade stand. Lemonade, nickel a glass. Every day, even during the frigid California winters, a bone-chilling 72 degrees, you could find her. You can have a sour, you can have a treat. Little girl's lemonade will knock you off your feet. The little girl with the sour brew wanted more. National distribution franchises, and so she rolled out a well-budgeted advertising campaign. Me and the rest of the dock workers only drink little girl lemonade. She was made president of the International Sour Drink Association and chosen to give the keynote speech at their convention. You all sat with words of wisdom, honey? You know what they say, Mommy. Always advertise so consumers think of your product first? I was going to say never swallow a lemon seed or a watermelon on your tummy. This fabricated but interesting story is to remind you that it's called advertising and it works. Put your message on this national advertising platform by emailing classicradiotheater at gmail.com. Classicradiotheater at gmail.com. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, the conclusion of the Great Gildersleeve, June 2nd, 1954. Yeah. We've got three peas. Piggy, Mr. Peavy, and the parrot. How about that, Aunt Parrot? I mean, Aunt Hattie. <laughs> I, I think I'll go to my room. <laughs> I don't understand this house. That parrot even talked back to me. Oh, well, perhaps today will be better. Good morning, Miss Hattie. Oh, I don't know, Bertie. No, ma'am? That parrot must have been in the Navy. Oh, yes, ma'am. That bird's seen a lot of duty. I, he was whistling out the window all night. <laughs> well, it's, it's not amusing, Bertie. Miss Peavy was very presumptuous in bringing it over. Well, Mr. Gillsleeve likes Mr. Peavy. Well, Throckmorton likes too many people. He's just a soft, 
much. Yes, ma'am. Oh, what are you doing with those eggs? I'm coddling eggs for Mr. Peavy. Well, uh, why doesn't he have them scrambled like the rest of us? Well, you're the only one that likes them scrambled. Well, that's the only way to eat eggs. <laughs> oh! Oh, oh, that horn again. <laughs> Leroy and Piggy are putting it on the car. Oh, that Piggy. Why Throckmorton tolerates him in this house, I'll never know. No, ma'am. Well, everybody comes and just stays. Yes, ma'am. Oh, sometimes. Sometimes I feel sorry for Throckmorton. Everybody takes advantage of him. Where is he? Oh, he's gone to the office. He's got an early call from the man. Now, take that sniffing air. I just know he exploits Throckmorton because he's easygoing. Oh, he's easygoing, all right. Well, well, I'm leaving this house. But before I go, I'm going to do Throckmorton a favor. You are? I'm going down and give that mayor a piece of my mind. Uh-oh. You water department, Commissioner Gildersleeve speaking. Miss Gildersleeve, this is Bertie. Oh, yes, Bertie? I've been trying to call you, but your phone's been busy. Oh, well, I've had a busy morning. I thought you'd like to know Miss Hattie's going home. Well. But before she goes, she says she's going to do you a favor. Yeah, oh, fine. What is it? She says she's going to tell off the mayor. Oh, where is she, Bertie? She's probably in his office now. Zeke, goodbye, Bertie. Oh, I've got to stop her. She wrecked me. Oh, why does Aunt Hattie have to take everything into her own? So when I got up this morning, Mr. Mayor, I said to myself, I'm going to take this matter into my own hands. My good woman, if you'll excuse me, I'm very busy. I, I won't excuse you until you answer a few questions. Oh, well, what is it? I suspect that you, like everybody else in Summerfield, take my nephew, Throckmorton, for granted. I beg your pardon? Do you know that he worked at the water department every night this week when he might have been home with his Aunt Hattie? Well, he tried to impress me by claiming he was going to work one night. There you go, belittling. He worked every night. He really did? He has to work. You should see the mouths he has to feed. Why, the poor man's at his wit's end. Uh, I've suspected that for some time. Yeah. But, uh... <laughs> he won't speak up for himself, so I'm going to. Throckmorton deserves a raise. Well, uh, I... I... Uh, Mr. Mayor! Yes, Gilsley? Your Honor, don't believe a word she says. Very well. What did she say? She just about talked me into giving you a raise. Oh, poo! <laughs> well, there... I gave your bags to the porter, Aunt Hattie. Oh, thank you, Frank Martin. Come again. I will. I had a fine visit. Good. And uh, I would have gotten you a raise from the mayor if you hadn't barged in when you did. Oh, yes. Well, it's my fault, Aunt Hattie. Yeah, I, I appreciate everything, though. Believe me. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye, Rock Martin. Now behave yourself. Uh -huh. Well, he's gone at last. Yeah, yeah, she's a good old soul. But oh my, what a relief. Oh, hello, Gildersleeve. Yeah, Mayor Twilliger. Uh, what are you doing down here at the railroad station? You, well, I... Uh, Gildersleeve, I've been thinking about that Aunt Hattie of yours. You know? Outspoken, refreshing, different. I admire her pluck. You do? Uh, Mrs. Terwilliger would enjoy knowing her. Why don't you bring her over to dinner this evening and we'll talk about that race? My race? You stop the train! And Hattie, jump! Oh, good night, folks. Great Gildersleeve is played by Willard Waterman and is an NBC Radio Network production. The show is written by John Elliott and Andy White and is transcribed. Included in the cast are Walter Tetley, Lillian Randolph, Stan Farrar, Noreen DeMille, Johnny McGovern, and Dick LeGrand. Musical composition by Jack Leakin. This is John Easton saying good night for the Kraft Foods Company, makers of the famous line of Kraft quality food products. 
Be sure to listen in next week and every week for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. June 2nd, 1954, The Great Gildersleeve on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. America's founders knew power corrupts, and ultimate power corrupts ultimately, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's why they built in checks and balances to prevent any one group from seizing all power. And that's why our president is elected by a college of electors, to protect the rights of little states like Delaware and Wyoming against giants like New York and California. After all, our country is a republic, the United States of America, not the United State. Our states are independent, sovereign powers who create created the federal government, not the other way around. And that's why all power ultimately lies in we the people and the states, not a central dictatorship of cronies. Did you know that? Thank God for the U.S. Constitution. Find out more how our amazing Constitution and Bill of Rights protect us, the citizens, against power craves politicians in Washington. Help us take back America. Go to OurAmericanRights.com. Brought to you by the American Media Council. We'll wrap up this hour of Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox with another episode of that sweet soap opera, Claudia. This was originally broadcast June 3rd, 1948. Time for dinner in the kitchen. And now, Claudia. La, 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 Hey, 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 not so much noise, Mrs. Brown. What? No vacuum. Please, Mama. Why not? This dining room rug needs it. The dog must be shed. Great Danes always shed. They like it. Well, I dare say I don't like it. Therefore, I shall continue to vacuum the rug. Oh. Now, come on, Claudia. You're in my way. Go on and enjoy this nice morning with David. Doing what? Doing what? Take a walk in the garden. Huh. Take a walk in the garden. What do you mean, doing what? You seem to forget that my husband is staying at home in order to facilitate the completion of the plans for the Chicago freight terminal. Any interruption of said concentration is unwelcome, inexcusable, and not to be tolerated. That goes for every type of noise, such as vacuum cleaners, washing machines, singing, and livestock tramping through the house. Also, questions of any and all descriptions. I've just been fired out of his room. Oh, my, such a tragedy. You certainly sound as if you knew it by heart. <laughs> I've heard it often enough. In fact, it was the last thing he told me before we went to sleep last night. And the first thing he said when we woke up. Sounds like a very thrilling and romantic marriage. <laughs> I, like a fool, was looking forward to his working up here. Mama, I tell you, the strain is going to be terrible. We might just as well have a, a genius in the house. What would the genius like for lunch? He said he wouldn't stop for lunch, not to bother. Just to hand him in some cool water and a crust of bread or something. Spartan, isn't he? Oh, full of character. I wish I had some of it. I have as much concentration as a flea when it comes to keeping my mind on something I have to do. Such as darning. Yes, such as darning. I unearthed a pile of socks and shirts that must have been accumulating for days. Weeks? Where'd you find them? Under two sheets that need mending inside a box on the bottom shelf of the linen closet. That will teach you to go snooping around. Anyway, you must admit it was all hidden away very tidily. Oh, very. That's what made me suspicious. Oh, shh. Be quiet, Shakespeare. You'll get your face in trouble. Hey, cut it out, cut it out. Stop playing with the cord of that vacuum. Please. I'd better leave it here instead of putting it back in the hall closet. It might disturb David if I pass his study. <laughs> he certainly has his two women towing the mark. Shh. Wasn't that his door opening? I don't hear anything. Oh, yes, yes, it is. He's coming. Well? I was just putting the vacuum cleaner away, David. It didn't sound right. Noisy. Sorry. Yeah. Let's see, I think it needs oil. Oh, don't you trouble. We'll check it later. You don't know how to check it. Well, darling, we're not going to use it anyway anymore, darling. That's a fine attitude. Let a delicate piece of machinery get ruined, and then you say you won't use that it. That wasn't the reason. It was so as not to disturb you, you, you ungrateful creature. It disturbs me a lot more to realize that you don't know how to take care of electrical equipment. Women shouldn't be trusted with mechanical devices. Huh. Modern household aids have progressed beyond the female capacity to understand how to handle them. Darling, shut up and go back to work. How can I when I, I see a good piece of equipment being abused? We are not abusing it. Anyway, who asked you to come in here anyway? It was making a funny sound. But we stopped it. You stopped the machine. You did not stop what was making the funny sound. I bet this thing hasn't been cleaned in six months. We've only had it two months. We've only had the rugs down one month, so don't bother. Uh, you've both got guilty consciences. 
Where's some old newspaper to empty the bag on? We have no old newspapers. Why not? Mama, why haven't we any old newspapers? We ate the last of them for lunch yesterday. Yes. Are you two women being fresh? We just want you to go back to your freight terminal. Oh, never mind my freight terminal. I want to see what's wrong with this vacuum. Nothing is wrong with it. Please go back to work, David, or I'll get the blame for disturbing you. I can feel it coming on Shore's fate. Now, in the first place, the proper way to fold the cord is not to bunch it up. I see. But to wind it carefully and evenly around these two little doohickeys here. I always do. It doesn't look like it. But I haven't begun to put it away yet, David. Well, maybe you know how, but not Claudia. I do no, so. Oh, no, no, no. Roll it up. Roll it up any which way. I certainly don't. And she wonders why the thing goes on the fritz. I never wondered why it went on the fritz. It was you. You haven't got sense to. It isn't on the fritz, though. Well, no thanks to her mother. You sound like you hated me. I do. I do when it comes to machinery. I hate all women. Well, I suppose we'll have to use today's newspapers. I haven't even read it yet. You won't have time to read it anyway, David. Oh, use the front page. Leave the theatrical section for me, and the death notice is for Mama. If you don't mind, the front page is the only part of the paper I happen to be interested in. It would be. Important things are happening in the world, and in case you fee two females didn't realize... What are more nasty words for the weaker sex, Mama? He's running out of them. I can't think of any except wife and mother-in-law. Yes, that'll do. Yeah, very funny. How does this do-wacky open? Uh, don't you know? <laughs> Listen, I'm not the one who had the demonstration lesson on it. I'm not the one who... Pushes it all around the house. You know, I no. thought that men just sort of sensed those things, you know, had a sixth sense about machinery. They have. I just wanted to give my wife and mother-in-law a slight boost in morale. Oh, here we are. David, you're not going to open empty that bag in the dining room. Why not? I've got the paper down. It isn't sanitary. We eat in here. More sanitary than the kitchen. You cook in there. There is something in what he says. <laughs> Well, there's very little dust anyway. Yes, I thought you said it needed cleaning. You probably never used now, it. Now, that is hitting below the belt. Besides which, you heard me use it this morning. That was merely to make an impression because I was home. You didn't kill yourself either. About two seconds and you were through. I stopped her because you were working, you, you, you ungrateful creature. You said that before. I, 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 I am speechless with fury. I'm the one who should be speechless with fury. I'm the one who was disturbed. I told you, didn't I, how important it was for me to have absolute peace and quiet. Well, you've got it now, so go back into your study and everything will be peace and quiet from now on. It's a solemn promise. I don't believe a word of it. Besides, as long as I'm at it, I may as well go ahead and oil this thing. How do you know it needs it? Because it was making a noise. Oh. Vacuum cleaners are supposed to make a noise. Not that much of a noise. Now, where's that little tube of grease that came with it? Well, I don't know. Did any come with it? Of course, of course it came with it. Mama, where is it? I haven't the least idea. This is your house, not mine. Well, well, well you're, you're living here. You should know things like that. Now, look here. I refuse to take any more blame for something I haven't done. I am only an innocent bystander. I began to use the vacuum cleaner this morning out of the goodness and cleanliness of my soul because the rug was full of your dog's hairs. And I've been paying for it ever since with blood, sweat, and tears. Blood, sweat, and tears. Where is the dog, by the way? I don't know. Out. Out where? Just out. We didn't want to disturb you. Since when does Bluff disturb me? He doesn't disturb you, but I do. Naturally. Bluff doesn't talk and ask questions. I am speechless. If I asked you one question, one little question. You're asking one little question now. Mother, where are you going? I'm going in the kitchen. My nerves will not stand any more of this. This what? I feel like I'm in a bad dream. Nothing makes any sense. All I asked was where was the grease to all the vacuum? And I said I never saw any grease. She did so. She poured it over yesterday's newspapers like syrup and ate it for breakfast. Go get me the directions. I'll see if we can use regular machine oil instead. Well, I don't see why not. Get the pamphlet of directions, Mama. It might surprise you, but I happen to know where it is. You do? Go and get it. David, mm? <clears throat> while you're at it, the plug on the electric iron is a little bit wobbly. Oh, a little bit wobbly. Yes. How many times have I warned you not to yank it out of the I wall? I didn't yank it out. Oh, now if you're going to ask for a complete case history of the electric iron, too, I'm sorry I spoke. Forget it. Here's Mama with your precious directions. I wish I were dead. What's the matter now? I made a mistake and mentioned the electric iron cord will be in for another third degree. Why don't you use your intelligence for once? Intelligence? Very funny. 
Go ahead and read your directions and get back to our now, Hush, hush. I'm trying to read now. If you'll just keep quiet. Can I'm you? Keep, keep the machine in a dry place. Empty the back of a purple spring. Sham shampooing attached blower. Can it shampoo? Uh, yeah, you can put it away now. The directions? No, the vacuum. But you haven't oiled it. Can't we use the regular oil? Apparently not. Oh, we dear. really should find the grease that came with it, Claudia. It probably does need oiling. And <clears throat> if it makes a funny noise, we might as well have it done while David's in a mood to... Uh... David's not in a mood to... No, he's mad. David, you show me where to put the grease, and as soon as we find it, I'll attend to it myself. Think no more about it. But I don't mind doing it. You're right, it's time I learned how to take care of electrical equipment in my old age, and, and Claudia, too. The manufacturers have done it for you. They're smart. They know that women never remember to oil things. So they're making household equipment that doesn't need oiling. Well, that's very nice of them. It's quite a help. Just a moment, please. I would like to examine Mr. Norton on the stand. Mr. Norton, weren't you awfully sure that the vacuum was making a funny noise? Weren't you awfully sure it needed cleaning and oiling? In fact, weren't you positively, absolutely positive that I had mislaid the little tube of grease that comes with the machine? Mrs. Brown, will you bear me witness? And just what are you trying to prove? I'll tell you what I'm trying to prove. You're not fit to touch my electric iron. You probably want to oil that, too. You mean he's not such a much, after all? He's just a, a, a Budinsky. Budinsky? Honestly, Mama, what he's put us through with that vacuum, what's a nasty word for the strong Longer sex. Pig-headed. Excellent. Hmm. I couldn't have expressed it better myself. Claudia, he's not even listening. He's looking out of the window. We might just as well be talking to the wind. I am looking what mischief your dog is up to. Ha-ha, now it's my dog. When Bluff behaves, it's his dog. Move aside, let me see. He is not up to anything. He's just standing there thinking. <clears throat> well, I'd better go and see what he's thinking about. David, come back. He's just enjoying the air. Claudia, let him go. But his whole morning will be shot and he won't get any work done. You're smart girl. You're awfully dumb at times. What do you mean? It's a beautiful day and he wants an excuse not to work. That's why he picked on the poor vacuum cleaner and now he's found bluff to play with. You mean he has no more concentration than I have? Yippee! I think you're right. Goodbye, Mama. Now where are you going? I, I don't know. Just someplace where David's going. But we'll be home for lunch. For a crust of bread, I presume. Yep. But you better have a small steak and an apple pie on the side. As you bustle about the house, bending your precious energy, you might bear in mind that houseworkers, too, deserve the pause that refreshes. The time you take to enjoy an ice-cold bottle of Coca-Cola is time well spent. Here's another suggestion. When you turn on your favorite radio program, reach for an ice-cold Coke. That's a growing family custom and a pleasant one. Oh, Mr. King, I fear me that David isn't going to get a great deal of work done today. Mm, that's always what happens to me when I stay home. There are suddenly so many things I'd rather do. Well, at least he can't blame it on us. Claudia and I were being as quiet as two mice. Mm. Two mice with a vacuum cleaner. Oh, you two. Well, I'm glad to see Claudia and David having such a good time together. No, there aren't very many marriages like theirs. Many too few. This is a happy marriage. It's good to see. Mm, speaking of marriages, I understand Mr. Killian, David's partner, is coming for dinner tomorrow evening. He is. He always gets such a lot of pleasure from watching Claudia and David. I suppose it's because his marriage isn't anything like it. Mm, I hardly even think of him as married. Well, we'll all find out more about it tomorrow. See you then, Mr. King. Goodbye, Mrs. Brown. As I was about to say, every day, Monday through Friday, Claudia comes to you transcribed with the best wishes of your friendly neighbor who bottles Coca-Cola. So listen again tomorrow at the same time. And now this is Joe King saying au revoir. June 2nd, 1948, Claudia on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Thank you so much for making us a part of your day. Would you thank this radio station and support their advertisers? It is their kindness and courtesy that allows us to be with you each and every time we roll around here on your favorite radio station. And if you miss a day on this station, you do not have to miss a single show because you can always hear our shows through Spotify, through Spreaker, which is our home base, Spreaker. Also, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon. Uh, the Audible app on Amazon is what you want there. Just search for Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. That's Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Or you can also find them at my webpage, 
classicradio.stream. You can stream our shows on demand. You can learn more about Classic Radio Collecting. One of the top pinned posts has our Facebook and uh, Twitter feeds, and you can also find the feed if you want to send me a Dr. Pepper. I would certainly appreciate that. That's at classicradio.stream. Thank you so much for tuning in. Tell all your friends the great radio shows are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station.